We've built quite a number of expensive rigs on the channel recently, so we prepared a budget PC build for you guys and packed this video with tips and tricks when it comes to building a solid 1080p gaming rig for under 500 USD. In light of spending uh, lightly, this video is brought to you by Aerocool's new Cylon Mini. Clocking in at around 35 bucks, it's the first area you can save money when building on a tight budget. You'll get the addressable RGB integration, which is pretty sweet for this price category, and the micro ATX form factor pairs nicely with cheaper MATX motherboards. Click the link below for more details. So let's start things off with our own budget build for late 2018, and we'll mix in some buying tips along the way. There are certainly compromises involved. Every budget build will have at least one but I don't think you'll be too disappointed with this one for the price we spent about 450 bucks on it what you're looking at here is a Ryzen 3 1300x paired with the stock cooler and the cheapest AM4 motherboard we could find it was actually reviewed in this video right here rather extensively now I know what you're thinking a 1300X, come on, Greg, you'd be just fine with a 1200, this is wasted money. And you're right, in all honesty, our 1200 sample was a bit preoccupied at time of filming, but we're linking it down below in place of the 1300X because the frequency disparity alone in our testing won't cut heavily into your frame rates. That and the 1300X is virtually out of stock everywhere thanks to Black Friday sales, so at 77 bucks on Amazon, I'd say the 1200 will do just fine. It'll also run super cool on the stock cooler thanks to its ultra low TDP and the lack of overclocking support on our A320 chipset. The RAM we're sporting is tuned specifically for Ryzen platforms, meaning we had no problems at all reaching 3000 megahertz even on this cheap AM4 board. Higher frequencies are important for Ryzen, we've discussed this in previous videos, latencies between CCXs are tied directly to the speed, and lower frequencies can negatively impact gaming performance as a result. This particular kit consists of two 8 gig modules for 16 in total, which is becoming the recommended minimum for a lot of newer titles. Total cost? It's about 130 bucks, but you could find cheaper kits. Again, I'm stressing the frequency in this case. Stuff that isn't really optimized for the chipset won't likely run at rated frequencies out of the box on first gen Ryzen. And of all of my rated Ryzen samples, this many of them allowed me to run XMP out of the box. That's zero. There are certainly trade-offs here, and I just decided to approach it with the best RAM kit that we could buy in around $120 price range. The black also looks pretty sweet with our black cooler and board as well. Up next is our graphics card. This is a GTX 970 from EVGA. I covered it in this dedicated video right here, but I sincerely believe this to be one of the best bargain buys of 2018. Even the 980 Ti for some upper level gaming in 1440p, but for 1080p at medium to high settings, the GTX 970 just it takes the cake in my book. It clocks in just below a typical 6 gig GTX 1060, which often costs two to three times more. I mean, sure, comparing a used product to a new one is a bit unfair, and you'll certainly have less luck buying used versus new, but I think you'll be all right in most cases. People willing to lie and sell you stuff that doesn't work over a site like eBay have to deal with the buyer protection guarantee. Nine times out of 10, I'll say you'll get your money back without a hitch at all if the product wasn't as advertised. Most people just aren't gonna waste your time. You'll always hear the outlier louder than anyone else Oh, I didn't get my money back, eBay ripped me off. But eBay is popular for a reason, and if they had these reputation issues, nobody would use them. I think it's a great place to potentially save a lot of cash on especially a graphics card. We'll show benchmarks, by the way, of the system a little later in the video. Don't worry. Next up, we've got storage. This is where things become very preferential. I try to stay away from hard drives altogether, even in budget builds when SSDs are cheap enough. We picked up a couple of 500 gig Samsung 860 Evos for 73 bucks a piece on Black. Black Friday, and that price is actually still holding true today. You can find them linked below. Half a terabyte, in my opinion, is more than enough for several larger games on Steam. And if you're anything like me, you really only play about two or three games intently at a time. So unless you plan on installing your entire Steam library onto a drive at one time, one or two of these will do just fine. They'll also load content significantly faster than their hard drive counterparts. We installed one 500 gig drive into this system, and if the user feels the need to, say, add additional storage in the future for games, throwing in a one terabyte hard drive or two won't be an issue in a case like the Cylon Mini we used here. One of the last things we have to cover in this build is the power supply. Now some people will swear by only like 80 plus gold and higher rated units, but in a budget build that isn't likely to consume above say 
300 watts, and that's a liberal estimate. A 500 watt unit with at least an 80 plus rating will do just fine. A lot of my earlier builds on the channel that were under $1,000 uh, sported 500 watt EVGA PSUs with a mere 80 plus bronze rating. They were quiet and almost as power efficient by energy saved as their significantly higher rated units, right? So 80 plus efficient at 500 watts consumed results in the same power saved as 90% efficient at 1,000 watts consumed. And that's exactly why higher wattage units typically have higher 80 plus efficiencies. The unit we went with here is the Corsair VS550. It's a 550 watt 80 plus non-modular power supply. It stays actually pretty quiet under load, it's quieter than I thought it would be. And uh, yeah, I mean, that's something I didn't expect for a $40 unit. Sure, cables are the ugly and ketchup and mustard kind, but you can't expect too much out of such an affordable component. Oh, and also to touch on the used market for power supplies and storage drives just a bit, I think those are the two things that I would try to avoid on the used market, and I say that for a few reasons. For one, failure rates for older, cheaper power supplies especially are typically a lot higher, and these are the parts of your system that could potentially take other components with them, including another big failure point, motherboards. And let me tell ya, motherboards are a pain to troubleshoot. They're the last thing you hope breaks in a system, but it happens more often than you probably think. Storage drives are the same way. I mean, you really have no idea how many times data has been wiped from them, and they have a certain, you know, rewrite rate, uh, a certain number of rewrite times that each drive will hold. And until you do some digging and physically connect the drive, you've got really no idea what data actually might still be on the drive from the previous owner. Could have viruses, could have something else. Uh, you know, it's it's definitely like tinfoil hat time here with, with these two, but uh, it just, to play it safe, my rule of thumb, if you can afford the extra 10 or 20 bucks for each unit, they're typically not too expensive to begin with. It just makes more sense to buy something with a better warranty uh, that is new. So you have more peace of mind. If it doesn't work out of the box, just return it hassle-free and you'll get something new very soon. Now on to performance. I'm always impressed with how great these Ryzen CPUs are from a value perspective. I mean, sure, four physical cores is kind of a kick in the teeth all around in 2018, but for well under a hundred bucks, I mean, it's difficult to complain, right? A CPU pushing out this kind of Cinebench score two or three years ago would have cost around 200 bucks. We're talking about Core i5-7400 territory from Intel. And we have the same core count here, right? Four cores, similar frequencies, allow these two to virtually trade blows in nearly all synthetic tests. And the i5-7400 at the time was actually a really great budget gaming CPU. So on to games, Grand Theft Auto V was a promising 1080p title for this rig, averaging nearly 100 FPS on high settings all around, save anti-aliasing and advanced graphics. I'd say this is a win for our 450 or so US dollar computer. And to top it off, our 1% lowest frame rates still averaged above 60, meaning even in frequent dips in performance stay above an acceptable threshold. Up next is Shadow of the Tomb Raider and the high preset. Gave us some, pretty much what we expected in 1080p. This is a newer title. It's pretty uh, pretty graphically intensive, especially in the DirectX 12 API. Overall, our average FPS was 53, just shy of our 60 FPS target. In this case, a GPU was definitely our limiting factor, keeping things behind approximately 94% of the time, according to the in-game benchmark. Witcher 3 is another game we expect to perform slightly worse than the status quo. Extremely GPU intensive, our GTX 970 takes over a majority of the load here, despite the game only running in the default high preset, shelling out an average 53 FPS with our lowest 1% of frames rendered, dropping to a mere 43 on average. Now, like, this isn't terrible by any means, but this is still an exception to the 60 FPS floor we're trying to stay above elsewhere. Dropping settings to medium should pick up the slack, though. Oh, and FYI, Witcher 3 cripples even high-end systems, but cheaper rigs will suffer greatly, so playing around with individual settings is important. In my opinion, if you insist on keeping, say, anti-aliasing around, which is pretty graphically intensive, make sure it's used sparingly, nothing more than, say, times 2 for any of these titles. Up next is PUBG, still not optimized for older platforms and still very choppy even in the high preset. We did manage well above 60 FPS on average, but the full story is revealed in our 1% lows, a mere 45 isn't gonna cut it. I mean, that's nearly half of our average frame rate. In this case, it means that we're gonna have quite the chop when we're gaming. It's a terrible experience all around for a game of this caliber, pretty fast paced and competitive. Fortnite yields a much more playable experience and almost always does with respect to its PUBG counterpart. F1 2017 provided an excellent in-game experience in the high preset. Our budget rig pumped out 100 FPS, get that, on average in the high preset with the lowest 1% of frames dropping just to a mere 90. I mean, not, no big Big deal, right? This is pretty sweet, actually, especially when seen in the context of a racing game, right, with questionable weather conditions and 
high-speed turns, though in general racing games do run smoother than their first-person shooter counterparts since maps are much smaller, more consolidated, and detail in this case is strictly emphasized on the road, so our system doesn't really break a sweat here. And all in all, I think anyone on a tight budget would be very impressed with the performance this little machine's packing. We've got the SSD with ample storage for quick boot times and plenty of files and games, a solid graphics card, a proper quad-core CPU despite having the stock cooler it's actually very quiet, a quiet power supply as well, and a case that gets the job done for cheap while looking good at the same time. Feel free to play around with the different parts linked below and build something similar for yourself or a friend if saving money is a top priority. Look, there's nothing wrong with saving money at all. And I think most of us have been in a situation where we're pretty tight on cash and you want to squeeze out as much value as you can. Nothing wrong with that at all. So that's a wrap, folks. I do hope you've enjoyed this one. Budget builds are always fun. And I have plans to build more like this very soon, so don't worry. Just stay tuned. Thanks again to Aerocool for sponsoring this video. Show them some love via the top link in the video description. That would be greatly appreciated. And shop Amazon with our links to give us a small, also appreciated kickback. If you guys like this video, you know what to do. Thumbs up, thumbs down for the opposite feeling, or if you hate everything about life, you can click that red subscribe button if you haven't already. If you want to be a cool kid, that's what I would do. And stay tuned for, again, that next video coming up here very soon. This is Science Studio. Thanks for building with us.